Hi, and welcome to the American Society of Echo E3 lecture series. My name is Lucy Safi, and I am Director of Interventional Echocardiography at Hackensack University Medical Center and Chair of the ASC Emerging Echo Enthusiasts, also known as E3 Special Interest Group. This special interest group provides an opportunity for early career physicians, sonographers, and trainees who are interested in echocardiography to present, interact, and discuss echocardiographic topics. Each lecture is formatted as a 30-minute didactic lecture followed by a panel discussion. On the panel will be two moderators and an expert in the field. During the discussion session, the panelists will also answer audience questions, so please enter your questions in the Q&A box below. This virtual lecture series will be recorded and later available online via the ASC E3 website. Today's topic will be assessment of tricuspid regurgitation. It is my pleasure to introduce my co-moderator, Dr. Akhil Narang. Dr. Narang is a car cardiologist at Northwestern and assistant professor of medicine at Northwestern University School of Medicine. Dr. Narang specializes in the use of advanced cardiovascular imaging, including echo, cardiac MRI, and cardiac CT, to aid in the diagnosis and management of patients. He is particularly interested in treating patients with structural and valvular heart disease. Welcome, Dr. Narang, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Savi. Our expert today is Dr. Ranuka Jain. Dr. Jain is Director of Structural and Interventional Echocardiography at Aurora St. Luke's Medical Center in Wisconsin. She is an active leader in the ASC and serves as the chair of the ASC 2021 Scientific Session Structural Track this year. She has been a longstanding member of ASC's National Guidelines and Standards Committee. It is a privilege to have you with us today, Dr. Jane. Thanks so much, Dr. Savi. It's great to be here. Our speaker today is Dr. Nadira Hamid. Dr. Hamid is a non-invasive cardiologist and assistant professor of medicine at Columbia University Medical Center. She also serves as Assistant Director in Structural Heart Echocardiography at Columbia University Medical Center and Associate Medical Director of the EchoCore Lab at the Cardiovascular Research Foundation. Dr. Hamid graduated from Royal College of Sur Surgeons in Dublin, Ireland. She completed her postgraduate degrees with the Royal College of Physicians in Ireland and Royal College of Physicians in the United Kingdom. She completed her residencies and fellowships in Ireland, Singapore, and in New York. Welcome, Dr. Hamid. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Safi. Good evening, everyone, and I hope everybody had a great Memorial Weekend. I would like to first thank the American Society of Echocardiography, Dr. Safi, and her committee for the kind invitation, and it's an honor to be on this esteemed panel. So today I'll be talking and presenting on tricuspid regurgitation, quantification and classification. I have no disclosures. Over the last couple of years, tricuspid valve has become an unforgettable valve. It is highly variable in terms of its anatomy and morphology. It is a high pre and after load dependency and is a low pressure environment with a slower jet velocity. And imaging the tricuspid valve can be challenging. The position of it is in the anterior inferior and can get acoustic shadowing from the left heart, particularly in the, in the presence of artifacts such as the left-sided mechanical or bioprosthetic valves. In addition, the tricuspid leaflets are thin, so it may be challenging to image them um, accurately. Also, over the last couple of years, the role of transthoracic echo has proven to be very crucial and as a first line in tricuspid regurgitation assessment. And we should move away from a visual assessment as what we call an eyeball assessment, and there is a need for a more accurate and quantitative assessment. In terms of the etiology of tricuspid regurgitation, we all know it's divided into a primary and secondary tricuspid regurgitation, with the primary pr predominantly being a myxomatous degenerative disease, presence of prolapse or flail, and other associated, such as pacemaker-associated or induced tricuspid regurgitation. Majority of the tricuspid regurgitation is functional, about 75%, and this is due to feathering or tenting of the tricuspid valve leaflets, displacement of the papillary muscles, the presence of RV dysfunction or dilatation. And we see a lot of uh, TR in patients with atrial fibrillation, and this is termed as atrogenic functional tricuspid regurgitation. 
And so as per the American Society of Echocardiography Guidelines in 2017 by a document by Professor Zogby and colleagues, highlight the three grades of tricuspid regurgitation from mild, moderate to severe, highlighting the qualitative Doppler assessment, semi-quantitative and quantitative assessment. Semi-quantitative assessment include the hepatic vein reversal, vena contractile width, and quantitative assessment is by PISA ER, effective regurgitation orifice area, and hence calculation of the regurgitation volume. In this document, it also highlights the advantages and pitfalls of each and all the parameters as shown in the previous slide. But just to highlight you the qualitative assessment of the CW jet, the flow profile shape determines really determinant is determined by the TR severity. It's highly dependent on the preload and afterload, the RV function and loading, and also including the RA compliance. You can see on the left-hand side the different shape profile of the CW jet in the different stages. For example, like a left-sided valve disease on the left-hand side, patient with a severe pulmonary hypertension where there's a reduced RV function and normal RA compliance. And the third one is where an atrogenic TR, you can see the different flow profile shape and the density as well. In terms of the color flow jet, it is the direction and the shape may actually tend to overestimate or underestimate the tricuspid regurgitation, especially if it is an eccentric wall impinging jet. It's very dependent on the driving pressure and the jet direction. And in the document as well, Professor Zogby described as the severe wide open TR have a low velocity without aliasing or turbulence. And so it can be difficult to see it as a distinct jet by color Doppler. But what is crucial with any valvular disease is that it's a multi-parametric approach. So similarly for the TR in the document by ASC 2017 guidelines, we would want a multi-parametric approach, including the vena contractor width, effective regurgitant orifice area by PISA and regurgitation volume. But note that there's a reliance on PISA method alone. And so there's a need for a more granular and quantitative approach for tricuspid regurgitation. So let me take you back in 2017, where Dr. Han uh, was a national PI for this early feasibility of a transcatheter valve disease, which is involving a uh, annuloplasty device called um, annuloplasty. It's called the trial line, and in this study, it shows the reduction in the quantitative EROA just by one grade, which is equivalent by 0.2 centimeters square. However, in the study, it does not take into account the torrential nature of tricuspid regurgitation. The fact that the reduction of TR grade just by one grade actually result in patients feeling so much better due to the increased forward stroke volume and significant improvement in the quality of life measures. And hence, there is a need for more granular scale and expansion of the TR grading scale beyond severe. And so in this trial, there was a proposal of the new parameters and this include average vena contractor diameters from your orthogonal views, which is your RV inflow and your four chamber view. Secondly, is the 3D vena contractor area. And the third one is quantitative methods by 2D calculating the difference between the stroke volume across the tricuspid valve and subtracting it from your forward stroke volume, be it an LV or your right ventricle. And so the new TR grading scale has the expansion from severe to massive and torrential. And this includes the vena contractor width, your PISA, and your 2D quantitative assessment. But going back and rewinding to why do we need to perform all this quantitative assessment? There have been numerous studies in the literature showing the prognostic importance of the different morphology of the different types of TR as shown in the earlier slide. So any form of TR meaning that any severe TR and above will have a poor prognosis. So in this paper by the International Trival Registry of the Midterm Results by Dr. Tara Maslow uh, and colleagues, showing the 312 high-risk patients with severe TR at different centers undergoing transcatheter tricuspid intervention. It shows the procedural success with a reduction in at least one grade and also showed the baseline co-optation depth of more than one centimeter is the identified as the best cutoff to predict the risk of pro procedural failure. But overall, what is important in this trial is that the clinical and anatomical features of a patient is key 
as to which patient should have the appropriate intervention. And they found that the patient should not be too advanced in their disease stage. And so hence, careful anatomical selection in terms of imaging is crucial to predict the efficacy of your transcatheter valve intervention. And hence, in this paper by Santoro and colleagues highlighting the outcomes with the new grade grading scheme of your TR severity assessment. It shows that patients with massive or torrential tricuspid regurgitation have higher risk of death and also in terms of mortality and also establish this new algorithm of this expansion shows who will benefit from the therapy the most. With the trivalve registry as well, massive or torrential TR was actually seen in 46% of these patients in this real world registry. The procedural success rates are similar in both groups, and that similarly, baseline massive or torrential TR is associated with an increased risk of one year death of any cause of heart failure or pre hospitalization. But what it shows in the real world that it helps to support the use of the expanded grading scheme to predict the clinical outcomes after your transcatheter tricuspid valve intervention, and hence, there's a need to define these parameters which will help predict the procedural success and also in addition guide to your decision and your team decision and for the patient selection of the device. Of course, this is a work in progress of the numerous papers with regards to the prognostic implications and novel algorithms, as you can see in this slide by Dr. Fortuny and colleagues highlighting the prognostic implications of a novel algorithm to grade TR. In this study, it shows both ERA by PISA and Vena Contractor Wave perform well in stratification, and they combine it into a novel algorithm to classify moder moderate, severe, and torrential TR. There's newer cutoff values, but of course, it needs to be further validated in other cohorts, and it's work in progress. As you know, in the last couple of years, one, two years, there's been an increase in transcatheter tricuspid devices, which includes co-optation enhancement devices, annuloplasty devices, and valve replacement. But what really is key is the crucial step of really imaging with transthoracic imaging and transesophageal imaging. For your transthoracic imaging, you would need it for your pre-procedural, for your screening, and also in your post-procedural follow-up in terms of assessing the residual TR severity, your residual effective orifice area and diastolic gradient. And we shouldn't forget as well the right side, uh, right heart chambers in terms of measurement of your RV remodeling post-intervention and newest parameters such as RV strain or using of 3D. Transesophageal imaging is key in your pre-procedural and also in your intra-procedural imaging. So back to your transthoracic quantitative measurements. So your TR grading scale, the expansion, what is really important is your PISA method, your quantitative Doppler by 2D, 3D color Doppler, and all these three methods shows uh, will give you your effective regurgitant orifice area and your regurgitation volume. In terms of your PISA, it, it does have its limitations. It's assume a flat surface of leaflets, assumes a circular orifice, and assume a hemispheric proximal convergence. And it measures just a single time point. And we know that the tricuspid regurgitation jet is a very complex jet. Uh, it's ellipsoidal, it's a stellar shape, it's highly variable according to your respirophasic variability or your imaging plane variability. And so Winkle et al. demonstrated the concept of integrated PISA to really account for your temporal changes in terms of your regurgitation volume throughout your systolic cycle. So in our lab, we actually measure your PISA radius at each and every systolic cycle, taking an average of your regurgitation volume, enhance your PISA ERA, in this case highlighted with a large torrential tricuspid regurgitation and a PISA ERA of 1.98 centimeters square. And hopefully the role of automation can help ease our workflow in this process. The second method with regards to 2D quantitative assessment, now studies have shown the use of single plane tricuspid annular diameter just measured by, by four chamber view. So we refine the method by using orthogonal plane annular uh, diameters, using your minimum and your maximum diameter in your mid diastole one frame after your initial valve opening, because in the context that these annulars 
of the tricuspid valve is an ellipsoidal annulus and hence giving you a more accurate measurement of the area. We will use your orthogonal planes of your RV inflow and your four chamber, or you could use your simultaneous biplane imaging. With that, you do have to ensure that your pulse wave VTI is the most parallel to your insulation beam with your pulse wave sample volume in the center of the annular orifice. So here you can see the measurement of your RV inflow and your RV focus viewing your mid solid frame. Multiply that by 0 0.785 to get your annular area and multiply that by your tri uh, pulse wave DTI as your analyst to get your stroke volume across your tricuspid valve. And in reference to your stroke volume of RV or ILV stroke volume in the absence of regurgitation, you would then obtain your tricuspid regurgitation volume and divide it by your TRVTI to get your tricuspid uh, regurgitation effective orifice area. The third method is regarding to your uh, 3D uh, transthoracic imaging. 3D uh, has really revolutionized. And here you can see in the top right hand corner with transthoracic imaging, we were able to visualize the lead impingement of the um, tricuspid uh, valve on the septal leaflet. In addition, um, you know, it does have its limitations in terms of dynamic jet, presence of multiple jets, and also in a busy echocardiography lab, it can be time consuming and can be challenging for some patients due to the imaging with the, uh, uh, plane variability and also has this limited spatial resolution. So here I'm showing you a case for a patient of ours with a post uh, tricuspid clip uh, intervention. Here we did a 3D of the color Doppler and averaging across the systolic uh, cycle with a 3D vena contractor area residual post tricuspid clip of a 41 millimeter square in the mild moderate range with only a regurgitation volume of 26 cc's with an improvement from torrential tricuspid regurgitation. So comparing uh, 2D PISA and 3D vena contractor area in our core lab, we showed that there is a strong correlation between the Doppler EROA and 3D vena contractor area. Of course, your PISA effective regurgitant orifice area and regurgitation volume is significantly lower than your quantitative Doppler and 3D methods. And our cutoff for this uh, study on the data that we have actually has a lower cutoff, like a 3D VCA of 0 0.60 as compared to the table shown earlier uh, and the PISA of 0.34 centimeters square. Similarly, in a paper by Utonomia and colleagues, also highlights the difference between the 3D vena contractor area and 2D PISA EROA, which is associated with the different numbers and shape and the spatial extension of a VC. So may lead to a misclassification, but really 3D vena contractor area is, um, has independent and incremental value to grade TR severity over your clinical assessment. So now I'm gonna take you through the key transthoracic uh, views essentially for imaging the tricuspid valve. So here in the state-of-the-art review uh, paper by Dr. Han in terms of evaluating uh, this uh, functional tricuspid regurgitation, not only show you the views, but highlight to you what are the leaflets associated with each of this um, tricuspid valve. So here the first view would be the parasternal long axis view, the RV inflow view. So if you see the coronary sinus, here would be your septal and your um, and the anterior uh, leaflet. So here in this view, you would like to measure your vena contractor. You can perform the PISA and also the pulse wave and the CW Doppler at the annulus and the leaflet tips. And here we would also measure the tricuspid valve annulus and as you can see in the image here of 4.1. The next view is your parasol short axis view, and here really highlighting your anterior and posterior leaflets. The color doctor, you can see the extent of the tricuspid regurgitation jet in the anterior posterior view. And similarly, you perform a PISA measurement here with a CW and pulse wave Doppler at the annulus and the leaflet tips. One of the views, uh, the most important, I think, is the apical four chamber view, the RV focus view. Here, similarly as well, you will highlight the right heart chamber. You can see the right atrium and the enlarged right ventricle. And here, a color Doppler as well is placed for you to measure the vena contractor, shift the baseline shift to perform the PISA, and indeed 
again, do your CW and the pulse wave W just because you're in line with the information beam. Not forgetting your subcostal view. Here you can see in this image on the bottom left-hand side, the dilated inferior vena cava and the much minimal uh, respophasic variability, highlighting the severity of the as a supporting sign as your severe tricuspid regurgitation. Pulse wave of your hepatic veins shows the systolic flow reversal in your hepatic veins. And in addition, the 3D, as mentioned in transthoracic imaging, is key as well. So here are three cases where I've seen the, highlighting the different stages of your tricuspid regurgitation from severe to massive and torrential. And what is key is you can highlight the large gaps, as you can see in the tor torrential tricuspid regurgitation, and you can see in the 3D very nicely. In addition, the 3D transthoracic, as seen in the case earlier, um, highlighting the lead impingement on the septal leaflet. And with your trans, uh, esophageal imaging on the bottom left-hand side, you can see the yellow arrow, the lead impingement on the septal leaflet. And this is seen in your transgastric views. So here's just a little checklist from your transthoracic imaging, what is key um, that we put, that I put together. First step is to really optimize your 2D image, Col draw on your color Doppler, and then next is to really baseline shift for your PISA measurement. Next will be your Dopplers in terms of your CW, making sure you capture both the diastolic and the systolic flow. The third is your pulse wave Doppler and your annular plane to measure quantitatively of your 2D. And of course, not forgetting your 3D with and without color Doppler. And so let me show you a case example. And here is a case example of a patient with torrential TR in the first view of your RV inflow. What you can really see is that really tenting and really a large male co-optation of your tricuspid leaflet. You can see the large co-optation uh, co gap in your RV inflow here is measured at 1.2 centimeters with a large vena contractor of 1.31 centimeters. And you can also measure your jet area of 16.6 six centimeters square. Moving next to your apical four chamber views here, again, you see that large uh, malcoaptation gap. Vena contractor here measured at 1.98 centimeters and taking an average from your RV inflow and your apical four chamber view here, an average vena contractor width of 1.65 centimeters. In terms of your PISA quantification, the PISA radius here, I would measure it at every single frame of your systolic cycle, taking an average of 1.2 centimeters with your TRVTI of 42.7 centimeters and aliasing velocity of 3.5 centimeters per second. Your PISA effective regurgitation orifice error is measured at 1.98 centimeters square with a large regurgitation volume of 85 mils suggesting that this patient has torrential tricuspid regurgitation. Now, how about your 2D quantitative assessment? So similarly, as mentioned earlier, you measure your annulus and your RV inflow and your RV uh, four chamber, RV focus view, sorry, and with calculation of your tricuspid valve annulus area of 18.4 centimeters, you will multiply by your pulse wave at your annulus and give you a large stroke volume of 237.4 mils and subtracting from your forward stroke volume, your TR regurgitation volume is at 155 mils and divided by your TR VTI would give you a large 2D effective regurgitation orifice area of 3.63 centimeters square, consistent with torrential tricuspid regurgitation. The next section that I would like to just touch on very briefly is regarding transesophageal echo. Numerous papers show the importance of TEE, especially not only in your pre-procedural, but also in your intra-procedural uh, cases for your tricuspid valve intervention. And what is key is your multi-level imaging of your tricuspid valve. It is key to not only get your mid-esophageal view, your distal esophageal view, transgastric and deep transgastric views. Here you've seen on both sides of the slide is your commissural view with the X plane across on your left hand side, your entroceptal view of your color and uh, with and without color. On the right hand side, you can see the X plane across your posteroceptal view to see the uh, leaflets in the posterior and septal view. 
What's the other key view would be your transgastric view. You can see the image on the bottom that this is, you can see the extent of the tricuspid regurgitation. And in this view, you can also appreciate the anatomy of your tricuspid valve and the different morphology. And so with your transgastric view and your transesophageal view, you can appreciate your tricuspid valve, uh, the different nomenclature as proposed by Dr. Han and colleagues, the standard echocardiography tricuspid valve nomenclature, which was recently published. Here, you this manuscript described the four types of a tricuspid valve morphologies from T TEE imaging, and it highlights from your multinational retrospective registry. Majority of the uh, cases, about 54% was of tri-leaflet, but there is a substantial amount of patients who have quadricuspid valve with uh, type 3B, where you have two posterior leaflets being the most common. So here, let me show you a examples of the different tricuspid valve leaflets. So here on the top left hand side, you have the two leaflet uh, configuration. On the right hand side, you appreciate that it's a quarter cuspid with the presence of two posterior leaflets labeling as type 3B. And the bottom left is a patient who has quarter cuspid with the presence of two septal leaflets. And the bottom right, you can see that there's multiple uh, segments, at least a five leaflet morphology with the presence of two anterior and two posterior leaflets. And this is type four based on the classification. The last section that I would like to touch on is regarding the right side of the heart. Um, of course, I've taken you through the tricuspid regurgitation grading scale and the severity, but it's important to, uh, to visualize and really assess the right ventricle in the assessment of all of these tricuspid uh, regurgitation patients. In terms of your right ventricle size, as per the AFE guidelines, we would measure it in your RV focus view, the linear measurements from your base and your mid, but it does have its challenges and pitfalls. Obviously, it's highly dependent on your probe rotation. It also depends on how the RV is dilated in a chronic volume or pressure overload state and the direction of the RV dilatation as well. In addition, it can be difficult as well to image the RV lateral wall, so we may under and overestimate um, these linear dimensions. In terms of your RV function, you can see here the numerous uh, parameters from your fractional area change to your tissue Doppler as prime. And we all know that the right ventricle is a complex geometry, um, in complex geometry. And so to get an accurate and precise measurement for RV function uh, with echo can be difficult as compared to other modality imaging. Of course, there's newer parameters that we would like to do as well with 3D RV volumes and uh, RV global longitudinal strain with newer software. The challenges, of course, would depend as well, similarly as the previous slide with regards to probe rotation and really uh, imaging the RV lateral wall. We do also need to assess the right atrium. Uh, as standard practice, we measure the RA size, the single plane area length, and the 2D RA volume. And we should also consider measurement of your RA from by 3D volume and also the utility of your RA strain. A recent paper by Dr. Moraro uh, and colleagues highlight the utility of um, RA uh, volume as a major predictor for the presence of tricuspid uh, regurgitation, uh, dilatation in patient with functional tricuspid regurgitation, irrespective of the arrhythmia or the RV loading condition. So in conclusion, um, you know, I've shown you that there's a need for a comprehensive evaluation of tricuspid regurgitation, not only in terms of severity, the dilatation, the leaflet tethering, and the tricuspid valve morphology, but it's also important to assess the right heart function. And so we are able to know when to really intervene on these patients, the earlier the better, so we can get a very good outcome. And of course, transthoracic imaging provides a comprehensive evaluation of the tricuspid valve using 2D, 3D, and assessing the right side of the heart. I've shown you the multi-parametric approach to diagnosing TR severity with the expanded tricuspid uh, regurgitation grading scale, the importance of transesophageal imaging in your pre- and intraprocedural imaging. And of course, all of this is important in our clinical decision-making for these patients on when best to intervene.
of course, this is a work in progress, and I'm really excited in this growing field with the growing evidence uh, in this area. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamid, for such a great and very detailed uh, presentation on tricuspid regurgitation. It was really amazing. Um, and I want to thank you so much for, for that excellent dis, uh, talk. I look forward to our discussion. Um, I want to encourage all of the audience members to ask any questions that you may have in the Q&A box below. Um, we will be uh, continuously monitoring it. And uh, this discussion, again, if you need to rewatch that great presentation, will be available for you on the ASC E3 website. Um, so I wanted to direct my first question to our expert, Dr. Jane. I wanted to get um, your opinion on how do you quantify tricuspid regurgitation in your lab? Is there a certain parameter that you use? Um, or, and can you please uh, you know, let us know what that is and what you would recommend? Thanks so much, Dr. Safi. First of all, I want to congratulate you, Dr. Hamid. It was just an absolutely outstanding talk. Um, I learned a lot, um, and I, I really appreciate the detail with which you went through the quantification and sort of the step-by-step -step assessment. Um, I'll start off by saying that these are not easy transthoracic echoes to do. Um, for a sonographer, this requires um, a lot of time. So this isn't your standard 45, 60 minute echo. Um, we a lot for our sonographers anywhere from 90 minutes to even up to um, two hours to get all of the views that we need when we're really evaluating tricuspid regurgitation. So the first thing I would say is you have to design a lab um, where you can flex that time to give a sonographer um, time um, to really evaluate the tricuspid valve in its entirety. The second thing, just kind of echoing what Dr. Hamid um, alluded to at many points throughout the slides, um, is that 3D transthoracic echo is critical. Um, I see one of the questions here about how do you know what leaflet you're seeing? Um, and in 2D, you know, my friend Karima Adetia at University of Chicago uh, published a great paper a few years ago. Um, you know, in 2D, it's all about probabilities. Uh, you see a 2D parasternal RV inflow view, and there's a probability that you'll have the anterior and posterior leaflets. And then there's another probability that it may be um, anterior septal. Um, and the 3D really helps you understand the entirety of the valve um, as you uh, look at, uh, you know, assessing the amount of TR. Once you confirm the assessment of TR, at least once we do this in our lab, um, then we go to quantification. Um, and to Dr. Hamid's point, there are a lot of great ways to quantify TR. Um, I would say in our lab, there is not one that is uh, better than the other. Um, it really depends on the image quality, how well we see a vena contracta. Um, I frequently find the 3D vena contracta to be the most helpful um, because as you alluded to, TR is, is not a circle. Um, it's often very complex. Some of uh, the TR jets are elliptical. Some of the TR jets are star-shaped. Uh, some have um, various degrees of jets in various parts of the, um, of the anatomy. Um, and so that that is how we approach it. We use all of them and we really sort of compare and put all of that together um, with an understanding of the patient. The final thing is your hepatic veins help you, but they're not um, a 100% either, right? So they are dependent on your RA size, your RA compliance, um, what else is going on? And so don't hang your hat on the presence or absence of um, hepatic vein uh, flow reversal. Um, and then the last thing I will say um, is that TTE helps you um, in conjunction with TEE. And it really is uh, assessing both of them um, together, um, not just one in isolation of the other. I hope that gives us an introduction to, to the subject. Anything else some of my colleagues would like to add? Dr. Narang, I know that you um, frequently um, do a very thorough tricuspid valve assessment um, in your lab, and I, oftentimes you use um, 3D. So can you talk, talk to us about how you use 3D in your lab to quantify? Yeah, absolutely. I think, first of all, uh, amazing talk, Dr. Hamid. That was really phenomenal. And I, and I really want everyone here 
to come back and look at this lecture later on because there was so much wonderful content that this is the type of talk you want to listen to every six months or a year and, and show it to all your fellows. I'm definitely going to do that as well. So congratulations. I think 3D is increasingly important when evaluating the, the severity of TR. I think for the reasons Dr. Hamid mentioned, the 2D quantification, especially with PISA, is fraught with errors and can lead to either underestimation or overestimation of the severity of TR. And so often 3D really is um, the most accurate way to look at that. I think it can be cumbersome with respect to averaging the systolic frames, but I think it is an important thing to get practice with. And what I would recommend and what we do in our lab is not to do it on, on card, especially from a transthoracic echocardiogram. I think we often uh, let the sonographer finish scanning the patient and then bring the study back to our workstation, sit with the sonographer, pull the patient's study up on either TomTech or another post-processing um, software and then really go straight frame by frame. And this is how I teach my fellows. I think in real time when we're doing TEE, I tend to do a combination of both real time assessment and um, an assessment uh, offline. So I think that's number one. I think number two is, you know, 3D really depends on, depends on accurate and high quality image acquisitions. And so what I often recommend, especially when doing a 3D assessment of TR with color Doppler, is you're looking at the regurgion orifice and so you really can have a narrow sample volume. So if you're using 3D zoom to really have a small zoom box that really focuses on the tricuspid valve. And remember, you don't necessarily in the 3D assessment, you're not, obviously you're gonna be looking for anatomy, morphology of the tricuspid valve and the, and the reason the patient has TR. But if you just wanna do a quantification, you really wanna hone in on that regurgitant orifice and, um, and then increase your frame rates. And so by doing that, by having a smaller Zoom box by doing multi-beat acquisition. These are opportunities for you to increase your frame rate to, re to really get more than three or four systolic frames. Remember, if you have a small zoom box and your frame rate is eight frames per second, perhaps only three of those eight are actually in systole and the rest are in diastole. And so if you have multiple beats, that's helpful to do. Um, I think it's, it's important to do a combination of 3D from multiple views as well. And so sometimes we have a mid-esophageal or deep esophageal that's excellent and we do a reconstruction from there. And then sometimes, especially in TEE, of course, but sometimes we, we prefer transgastric views when you're doing TEE. I think for sonographers who are listening to the call, really becoming adept at off-axis views. So not just your common peristernal views, but also going to the subcostal views where you can sometimes see the valve on short axis and really, especially in dilated RVs and do 3D acquisitions, live 3D acquisitions from there with multiple feeds. Um, and then I think there was a question on 3D, uh, on PISA, just 2D PISA. Uh, Dr. Safi, do you want me to, to bring that up right now? Yeah, that'd be great if you could just okay. show, show your slide. Let me just slide. share my slide and see if I can find this. I think so this just is, to add one point on uh, the multi-beat acquisitions, they're very, very helpful. But remember, you have to have the patient be able to hold their breath. Um, I actually will sometimes do multi-beat kind of at the end of a TEE. Um, when they're sort of waking up, um, and then I can have them do a breath hold. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great point. And it obviously is challenging in patients with atrial fibrillation, and, uh, and, and many of these patients have atrial fibrillation, probably more than three quarters of them. So th this is just a slide. This is actually from the AAC formula review guide. If you haven't checked this out, I think it's a great resource. But this is the principle of uh, calculating tricuspid regurgitation PISA, which, is, which, can, which can be done in calculating severity by two methods, as, as Dr. Hamid described. One is through the volumetric method, and the second method is through flow convergence method. And, and the principle is fairly straightforward for this. It's the, the flow convergence zone really corresponds to the regurgitant flow. And so as blood, velocity, as blood flow velocity increases and it approaches, the, it, it approaches the regurgitant orifice. And the PISA, or the proximal flow convergence zone, is described as these hemispheric shells in which the velocity of the um, surface of each of the cell, shells are equal. So the components that you need to, in order to calculate the PISA are listed in this slide right here. You need the radius of the PISA. And typically when we do um, our Nyquist adjustment, we usually make it about 30 centimeters per second for the tricuspid valve. We need to know obviously what the aliasing velocity is. So that's what we set to about 30 uh, centimeters per second. We need to know the VTI from the continuous wave Doppler where we get the Vmax. And then from there, we can calculate the Vmax and of course the VTI. And the formulas are shown here. First, to calculate the PISA, the regurgitant flow, and the EROA is simply the regurgitant flow divided by the Vmax. And the regurgitant volume is the ERO times the VTI. These are the cutoffs from the guidelines, but as Dr. Hamid mentioned, these are, there's a proposed extended classification scheme that really takes into account more than just severe TR that expands it to massive inferential TR. I'll stop yeah, my thank you. Here. 
Thank you so much. And basically, it is a similar formula to the mitral regurgitation on the tricuspid side, um, with obviously different cutoffs for degree and severity. And um, there's a couple of people mentioned averaging, and I wanted to touch base on that. Dr. Hamid, you mentioned, um, and I know you have uh, extensive experience in your core lab on averaging, and you mentioned that you average the pieces in the um, same frame, same clip. Um, so can you elaborate more on that? Do you get an average of the PISA in every single view, the inflow, the short, and the RV-focused views, or do you um, do it all in one frame? And then which one do you report? Thank you very much. That's a great question. So as what Dr. Narang mentioned, that you would like to do PISA in every single view to really get the best hemispheric shell, whichever you think is the largest. Um, and once I find um, which view that showcase this really well, I would select uh, each and every systolic uh, frame, uh, measure the PISA radius in each and every of the systolic frame, um, and then really taking an average of your PISA radius to calculate your PISA uh, effective regurgitation orifice area. So really the key crucial thing is not just sticking to one uh, imaging plane in terms of just focusing on RV inflow. And that really var it varies as well. I find that sometimes I got the highest PISA radius from your short axis view. And in some cases, I get it very high from your RV uh, focus view as well. So what's key is really, as what Dr. Narang and Dr. Jane mentioned, is really try your best to get all these views, these three views, and see where best you can highlight this visa uh, effective regurgitant orifice area. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Jane, I know that, you know, with severe TR, we often do see an RV uh, myopathy that forms. Um, can you elaborate on how you assess the RV and, and do you quantify the RVEF using certain methods? Yeah, no, Lucy, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, Dr. Hamid, you brought up a great point, which is that there are different types of TR. Um, and, you know, once you, once, you, once you understand that there are different types of TR, um, as sort of one of my mentors once said, you know, the eyes don't see what the mind doesn't know. So once you understand that there are the, the right-sided TRs from RV dysfunction, um, and then there are the idiopathic or atrial functional TRs, um, and they have different patterns associated with them. Let me see if I can share this slide. Um, because I, I think once you understand that, um, then you can see them and, and then you see them everywhere. Um, you're able to sort of understand what is, um, what are the different types of TR? Do you guys see my screen? Let's see if I can push that up here. Lucy, do you see my screen? Yes, we see. Oh, perfect. Okay, let me see if I can put this on here. Uh, slideshow from current slide. Um, and I, I think it's important when you when you look at TR um, to first of all recognize that there is tricuspid regurgitation and then ask yourself what is the etiology of it. Um, so you know Dr. Hermie talked a lot about the primary TRs, the tricuspid valve prolapse, the myxomatous TRs, um, the carcinoids of course, uh, but then in that pile of secondary TR which is about 75 to 80 percent of TR cases that we see, um, there are these two sort of different types of it. So there's that idiopathic TR, that atrial functional TR, those massive right atriums, um, usually associated with atrial fibrillation. Um, and what you have is tricuspid annular dilation from right atrial dilation and this sort of RV basal widening. And what happens is the TR leaflets are actually kind of sideways and they pull apart without the tenting. Um, and then there's the pulmonary hypertension, uh, left-sided disease, secondary uh, RV dysfunction. And there the RV, as you can see here at the bottom, becomes um, longer. It lengthens, it becomes more elliptical, and it actually pulls the TR leaflets towards the, the right ventricle. And that leads to this sort of tenting phenomena. And, and once you understand that there are different types of TR, then you, then you see them and you kind of understand them. Um, but to me, the critical part of TR and how people do, there are so many different parameters, 
but at the end it comes down to RV function. And if you have uh, some type of RV contractile reserve or function, um, the chances of eliminating your TR and you doing well are much higher. Um, and, and we, as just a standard lab, um, you know, we measure RV quantitatively in, in almost everyone. Um, and, and similar to TR, we do a combination of RV ejection fraction from 3D volumes if we see it well, um, RV GLS, which is pretty much routine in our lab, free wall strain as opposed to all six of them, um, and then TAPC, FAC. Um, to me, RV function is very similar to TR quantification. There are a lot of different parameters, um, and I think it's worth collecting a lot of data um, and then seeing which ones um, are going to prognosticate. Um, Dr. Hamid, what are, what are your thoughts? Thanks, Dr. Jane. I think you very well said the RV function is, is really challenging, um, not only imaging it really well, especially in these patients who are really dilated and really capturing the RV lateral wall, um, but like yourself, trying to get as many parameters and the data uh, to really support in terms of the RV function. Not only your fractional area change, your uh, tissue Doppler, but we also try our best to do your RV global longitudinal strain and the free wall strain. And also with the newer software with your 3D RV volume, I think it's uh, now much easier. Um, so there are, you know, the, um, the vendors are working really hard to ease our workflow. So really looking forward to this new technology really taking off and hopefully, you know, it's as close to uh, with the other modality. Uh, of imaging with regards to the RV, but still this is a space where there's much work in progress to do. But I think the more we do, the better we get. Um, and I think it's something that we really need to keep going at it. Yeah. And if you think, you know, left ventricular ejection fraction, you have mild, moderate, severe, these kind of categories, right, in these numbers. Um, but you really don't have a great way to say mild, moderate, or severe RV dysfunction. Um, for a lot of us, it's qualitative based on all the different parameters. Dr. Narang, what are your thoughts on RV function? Yeah, I think it's very challenging, as many of you uh, suggested. I think increasingly we're using 3D volumes to be able to do ejection fraction from TTE. And then strain, I think, is a critical component of this. And as both of you mentioned, there are vendors that are making it very easy for us to do auto strains of the RV. Uh, you know, I think in certain situations when we're challenged by this and we're not sure the imaging isn't great, we'll rely on cardiac MRI to be able to get some better assessment of that. I think when we're thinking of interventions for the tricuspid valve, it's, it's particularly important to understand when T, when, what the RV function is at baseline, because a lot of times the baseline RV function will impact how the procedural success will happen, not necessarily the procedure itself, but afterwards, how the patient will be afterwards if they become uh, further decompensated with heart failure, if after all that afterload is taken away from the reduction in TR, whether the RV will, will really fail further. And so... I think having a good sense of it is important. And when we can't do it from echocardiography, I think relying on, on other techniques like MRI are important. I feel like we, we learned it from MR, right? The functional MR, all of us that were in co-apt um, and have done a lot of these mitre clips in functional MR, that you make the MR better, but then the LV gets worse. Um, and you have that sort of acute phase um, of LV dysfunction uh, that you manage in the hospital, and then you see what happens uh, you know, afterwards. Um, I think TR is slightly different. So you make TR better, the RV is unpredictable in how it responds to it. Um, and RV dysfunction uh, to me is a lot more challenging to deal with in the hospital uh, than LV dysfunction from treating MR. You know, we've focused a lot on PISA and the tricuspid space. Um, what are your thoughts on the vena contracta? I know that there's a lot of limitations because we're talking now three leaflets instead of like two in the mitral valve. And depending on the angle, you can get um, different areas for the vena contracta or different diameters, I should say, for the vena contracta. Um, do you, uh, and this is open to all panelists, do you find that the vena contracta is less, of, uh, ac less accurate on the tricuspid side? I guess difficult question, right? 
You know, it, in a in a, a well done echo um, with a really dedicated sonographer, um, I really do love the 2D Vena Contracta as sort of a quick and dirty um, assessment um, in, in orthogonal views, right? Because it, remember, it's it's not just one view. Um, I, I think it gives you a really good guide, and I still do report it um, on echoes that are done um, for TR. In the quick TR echo, you know, part of uh, sepsis or, you know, something in the ICU where that's not the focus, I think it's less reliable. What are your guys' thoughts? I, I think you said it perfectly. I think it's a very um, challenging thing that really depends on really excellent quality views. So I, I would say I, I tend to use some of the more quantitative parameters much more so than the semi-quantitative ones. Uh, I do use it as a gut check once in a while but I, I tend to rely on some of the more other, the other primers, the PISA, the 3D more so. Mm -hmm. Same here as well. I think, you know, both of you said it very well. I don't really depend on it solely. Um, I would certainly measure it uh, in the orthogonal views, but that is not the key parameter in diagnosing TR severity. I would also do the other measurements to really support the TR severity for these patients. It's very difficult to know, you know, um, just from one view. So, you know, we do have to try to use all the views that we have and all the parameters and quantitative measures that we have. And, and you know, doc, like, just like Dr. Narang said, you know, if, if you know, transthoracic doesn't give you the, echo, the answer, then T, then sometimes you even have to go for, for CT or MR in order to really get a good assessment of the actual annulus and what's causing the tricuspid regurgitation. Um, especially as we get more and more advanced in these transcatheter procedures, we're going to need something that's reproducible and, uh, and accurate. So, um, you know, this has been a really great discussion. And again, I want to encourage the audience members, if you have any questions, to go ahead and um, ask them in our in our Q and A box below, and you know it was mentioned a couple of times during the talk that you know reduction of one grade of, of tricuspid regurgitation is often considered a success. And you know how do you um, how do you quantify that on echoes? They say someone did have a procedure and is coming back for a follow up. Do you do you quantify severe as less severe, or do you you know how do you write that in the reports in order to get to get that across. So um, I'll give it a shot first, uh, but that's an excellent question, Dr. Safi. I mean, you know, assessing uh, TR post uh, intervention obviously depends on which transcatheter device. So for your, you know, the uh, tricuspid clip, similarly for your mitral uh, side, it is very challenging. Uh, it does have its limitations for certain methods. For example, PISA, you can get an overestimation uh, due to the device. Um, and so in the case that I've shown you in the slides, what I usually do is try to get your 3D vena contractor and really measuring um, at uh, the, the minimum diameter, your vena contractor there using your 3D Q uh, software and depending on which vendor. And in the case I highlighted in the slides where, you know, visually, uh, you know, do not depend on your jet area because really constrained with the tricuspid clip. So just visually, it might look, uh, you know, severe, but really, really measuring uh, 3D vena contractor area is something that I would advocate for, but it is very challenging. Uh, especially uh, in a, we're using transthoracic imaging with the device there and trying to get the vena contractor and doing 3D and with the patient uh, respirophasic variability as well and having them to hold their breath. Um, so it was very challenging uh, for some patients, but in most patients I was able to obtain that as shown in the slides earlier on. Um, and that is what I would advocate for. Uh, obviously, quantitative measures in patients with uh, post uh, triclip will not be validated because you have an accentuation uh, with your pulse wave at your annulus. So, and so we are limited with assessing uh, TR residual for patients with a uh, post tricuspid clip. And so 3D really is very important. 
Uh, with regards to the valve replacement, obviously it will be much easier uh, assessing for your paravalvular leak or presence of transvalvular leak as well. Obviously not only visual, but also uh, using 3D as well to really assess it. And also very key uh, to measure the gradients uh, post intervention to ensure that there's no residual tricuspid stenosis uh, for these patients post uh, intervention. Mm -hmm. Dr. Narang, I know that you um, do a lot of tricuspid valve interventions. Um, how do you assess uh, post-procedural? I think Dr. Hamid said it perfectly. I think with edge-to-edge -edge repair, it is challenging. I think you really are obligated to find the largest PISA that's often adjacent to the edge-to-edge -edge repair device that you're looking at. And it's a lot of sophisticated um, movements by a sonographer to really uncover that. And often um, we, we are sitting with them. We have a group of small sonographers who are focused on the TR valve, especially post-protocol, to be able to assess it. Um, we also do look at secondary characteristics, for instance, the profile of the continuous wave Doppler jet um, compared to baseline, and then also some, some other things like hepatic vein flows. Um, when it comes to valve replacement, just like Dr. Hamid said, uh, we also use uh, 3D to be able to look for paravalvular leaks. Typically, it's less of a problem for valvular regurgitation in those situations. But I think in general, for both edge-to-edge -edge repair annual plasty devices that we do, and for valve replacement, we do uh, utilize 3D quite a bit to be able to look at for this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, I would agree. Um, I think 3D is critical, especially when you have more than, you know, two or three clips. Um, it really becomes quite difficult um, to understand it. Um, and, and we have the same thing. We have a, a group of core sonographers um, who are really just focused on tricuspid imaging for trials uh, because it, it just really is a, a specialized skill. The more you do it as a sonographer, uh, the better you'll get at it. Um, I, I have a, a, one of the questions that I thought was really great just to answer before um, our time runs up. Uh, one of the questions is, you know, have you found that there are certain types of TR patients um, that are more likely to be accepted for transcatheter uh, tricuspid interventions? Um, I think that's an outstanding question. Um, and uh, I think we're still learning. Um, uh, what I will say is that the, some of the atrial functional TRs that we see, it's too late. Um, and so I would put a plug in uh, the same way we learned on the mitral side that moderate to severe MR is, is probably a great time to intervene. Um, when you see torrential or massive TR, um, it's, it's sometimes is too late. Uh, the annulus is too large and, and that's our number one reason why people fail out of uh, transcatheter um, tricuspid valve replacement and, and even edge to edge repair. Um, you know, I, I think that atrial TRs can get quite massive and patients can be quite compensated for a long time uh, to the point when, when they present with symptoms, it's often too late. Um, but I would say that careful case selection is critical uh, in transcatheter interventions. There are patients that do very, very well um, if they're selected appropriately for the appropriate device. We're getting a couple of different questions on, um, you know, what if your lab doesn't have access to 3D uh, transthoracic? Uh, what is the best measure or parameter used to assess tricuspid regurgitation severity? If your lab doesn't have 3D, you need to get a 3D probe. <laughs> it really is, uh, it is the best way uh, to take a look at the, at the tricuspid valve. So talk to your vendors, see what you can do. Um, but I think 3D TTE um, is, is in my mind really the standard of care uh, when it comes to tricuspid valve imaging. And I, I do want to say that there is going to be, um, you know, further along in our lecture series, a dedicated tricuspid valve interventions talk, um, which again, will touch on a lot of these other questions that are coming in through the chat. So thank you for, for entering them. Stay tuned to later future editions of this lecture series where we will have a dedicated tricuspid valve intervention lecture. Um, there was a, a great question um, just quickly before we end. Um, you know, how do you account for diuresis and volume change between the transthoracic T? Um, you know, that's it's a very difficult question. Comes up often. How do you know the patient is optimized? Um, you know, when you're doing a T, and I guess you know, you just have to, I guess, present what you have, the data that you have at the time that you have it. And we often report um, blood pressure at the time, and if we can, IVC at the time. Um, are there any other um, inputs from your lab that you do just to answer some of these questions? You know, we Dr. often do um, 
we often dye the diaries the patient and really dry them out before performing our protocol TEEs and TTEs. It's such a volume sensitive lesion that I think you really have to do justice to the patient. And then a lot of times you'll realize, especially in patients with chronic right heart failure, AFib, or end stage renal disease, that once you improve and optimize their volume status, the TR can improve significantly. And so we really prove often with right heart cats that they're dry before we'll even subject them to the TR protocols. Um, in the interventional space, before we do a, an intervention on a patient with a, with, a, with a device, whether that's an edge-to-edge -edge repair, annuloplasty, or a valve replacement, we often admit the patients to the hospital a few days ahead of time to really dry them out and diarrhea them because it not only ensures that you'll have a better chance at procedural success, um, but it'll kind of give you the best baseline assessment for the patient. Uh, that's excellent. Um, well, I wanted to thank you all again for being part of this lecture series. I mean, it was really, really great, and it was so informative. Dr. Hamid, thank you so much for that excellent PowerPoint. Um, it was recorded and will be available on the, S uh, the ASCE 3 website, so feel free to um, log in and watch it again and again. Um, our next lecture is going to be um, back on a Monday, so Monday, June 14th, on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We look forward to having you all there. Thank you so much for joining in tonight. Take care. Thank you guys. Thank you all. Thank you.